joining us, and we have a few people coming in after looking for parking. Um, you're in for a treat this evening, and uh, as you may know, uh, the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, in addition to research and teaching, one of the things that we think is very important is convening and bringing experts from outside of Indiana to come join our community. And this evening, we are fortunate to have as our guest, Jane Wales, who is in residence this week as our distinguished visiting uh, fellow. And uh, I hope this will be a conversation. Uh, this is meant to be a conversation, not a, uh, not, not a uh, lecture or a proclamation. So I hope you will all um, join in our discussion here and take advantage of being in the same room with Jane. These days, you can see Jane on YouTube and all kinds of different venues uh, or anybody else you want to uh, hear about. But this is a real opportunity to be in the same room uh, with, as we say, a pioneer in philanthropy. So I'll just start us off with giving you a short sketch of uh, Jane's career, and then stop, start us off with a few questions about philanthropy, policy, democracy, and effective leadership, perhaps enlivened with a few digressions into the personalities uh, who bring life to our everyday work. So Jane, Jane is Vice President of the Aspen Institute and Director of its Program on Philanthropy and Social Innovation. She served as president and CEO of the World Affairs Council in San Francisco from 1998 to 2019. She is the founder of the Global Philanthropy Forum and co-host with Ray Suarez of the nationally syndicated NPR radio interview show, World Affairs. She has interviewed many household names in world affairs and philanthropy, which makes me feel a bit nervous, uh, and hopefully this won't be an episode of Between Two Ferns, so I'll go a little bit um, more co coherence here. Previously, she served in the Clinton administration as special assistant to the president and senior director of the National Security Council. She simultaneously served as associate director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, where her office was responsible both for advancing sustainable economic development through science and technology cooperation and for developing policy for securing advanced weapons materials in the former Soviet Union. In the Carter administration, administration, sorry, there was only one, uh, she, served as deputy, uh, she, she served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State and as Coordinator Public Liaison at the White House. In the philanthropic sector, Jane chaired the international security programs at the Carnegie Corporation and at the W. Alton Jones Foundation, and she directed the project on world security at the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. From 07 to 08, she also served as Acting CEO of the Elders, chaired by Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Tutu and founded by Nelson Mandela. In 2008, uh, she chaired the Poverty Alleviation Track for the Clinton Global Initiative Annual Meeting, and she is the former National Executive Director of Physicians for Social Responsibility that shared the 1985 Nobel Peace Prize during her tenure. She serves on the board of the Center for New American Security and Open Corporates, and chairs the board of FSG, a management consulting firm serving the philanthropic sector. So that alone should lead you to want to ask a whole bunch of questions. But let me begin with a personal note, and that is that I would not be here uh, were it not for Jane. And that's not because there would be nobody to sit here only, but she actually brought, uh, brought me on to work with her at the Rockefeller Brothers Fund back in 1997. And it was my first job in philanthropy. So she put me on, she helped me, she put me on the path that got me uh, here to come. So uh, you have her to blame or to thank for uh, me being on the road to philanthropy here as well. So let's start off the questions with uh, Rockefeller Brothers Fund, or RBF, as it is called. And maybe you can share, Jane, what the problem was that you were trying to solve when you led that project for the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Well, it was an employment issue for Mayor uh, Fassett, but it was, he's being overly modest. Is this on? Is this working? Mm -hmm. he's, he's being a little bit modest. He was, he was, yes, ma'am. Okay. He was um, deputy director of the project for moral security. It's not on. It's not on. No, I'm just yelling at it. Thank you. Uh, so Amir was, was uh, deputy director of the Project for World Security, and, and the problem we were trying to solve, we were trying to better understand what were the threats to and, and requirements of security um, in, when was this, 1996, 97, around then. So it was a time, it was the post-Cold War era, um, it was a recognition that many of the problems faced were transnational in nature. Um, and, and so you know, it was emerging infectious diseases, it was um, environmental degradation, climate change, all of them. They, 
there was this list of problems that, that no one state or no one society could solve on its own. In fact, no one sector could solve on its own as well. So a field of international security that had been dominated by governments uh, and, and the concept of sovereign governments, suddenly it wasn't just about governments. The solutions had to come from all three sectors, number one. And number two, it wasn't about the individual governments. It required some level of global governance. So the notion that the supply of uh, global governance uh, or, or the demand for global uh, governance was very much outstripping the supply. So what was the nature of the problem, and what role could philanthropy play in the solution? Does that just cover? And Amir came in to do a chapter, a fabulous chapter, on culture and identity and its role in philanthropy, and in particular in the world of, you know, this is, we, we stopped worrying about conflict between states then and became much more focused on conflict within states, like what's happening in Syria today, uh, or Yemen, we know that there's a proxy war as well. But, but that sort of deep understanding he brought to it. So he was, you know, I mean, you were a pioneer in the field. Then. I mean, now the world knows that we should be looking at issues of culture and identity, but you were ahead of us all. Well, let me try that other one. I mean, I, 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 He's also the engineer here, so. <laughs> Which is why it's not working, right? <laughs> right, it worked earlier. I thought it was good. Okay, we'll share. <laughs> so, you obviously spoke about the foundation during policy work, and you worked in both realms, foundation and policy uh, uh, making as well. How did the two interact? And obviously, one of the big issues you worked on was the non nuclear cooperative threat reduction. How did those two realms interact to? Uh, make that program possible. And we may want to explain a little bit about that program for this audience. Sure. Um, so this is the part of the I like best. Aww. I love the interaction of how this is and the reason that you can get by, by understanding both worlds. So if you have the opportunity to work in both realms, or in any two, uh, two sectors, uh, you have the private sector and the private sector, grab it. Uh, because it'll give you fresh insights on how you can get get certain things done. In this case, um, the president, uh, my, my focus was nuclear arms control primarily at that point in my life, and, and the president of the Carnegie Corporation asked me to have breakfast with him. I said, you say yes, you have breakfast with the president of the foundation. And he said, you know, look, I, I think that our system of non-proliferation isn't working. Can you come up with a new one? And, and so, so here's another piece of advice for your, for your uh, careers. Um, when you get asked that by a foundation president, the answer is yes. You have no idea what you're talking about. The right answer is yes. Because you know that he's going to give you the resources. You're going to have access to the best minds in the country and the world. Um, and the resources to be able to bring them together and, um, and, shine, and shine a light on, on some of the best ideas. Uh, do you mind if I go a little longer? Because this Please. is sort of a funny one. It, it's an odd combination of things. Um, but I, at the time, I had this burning worry that the Soviet Union would fall apart violently. And that, so you're in a civil war, kind of, multiple civil wars. And that meanwhile, there would be nuclear weapons material, high-enriched uranium, plutonium, uh, on the one hand, and nuclear weapons technology scattered throughout a crumbling society. A crumbling society. So it was a scary moment. And the question is, is there a new approach to deal with that? I knew a guy named John Steinbrenner, an international relations guy who ran the program at Brookings, the, the international program at Brookings. And he had this concept of cooperative security. And what he meant by that is, rather than try to defend against a danger, cooperate with your friends, but maybe even your adversaries, in reducing that danger to begin with. And so we launched a, together a consortium of uh, area specialists. So earlier we were talking about the importance of combining who know, our, know the regions, the people who are, you know, do strategic uh, local issues, uh, strategic arms control in, the, in this case, um, pull them together in a consortium and actually added um, a Russian 
who was in uh, an important institute, as it's called, in the Soviet Union that focused on policy issues, like national, international security issues. This consortium developed a concept uh, tested against place. You know, here's a great idea if it's between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, but does this work in a close, close place like the Middle East? You know, does it work in India and Pakistan? Will it work when, when the morning time is 10 minutes instead of 20 minutes, which matters? Uh, anyway, we brought these folks together. Uh, and I went to Sam Nunn, who was the senator of the U.S. He was a Democrat, he chaired the Armed Services Committee, and I said, look, we, we're, we're doing this, we're doing this blue sky thinking, um, we think it's going to be important, but it will be really completely unimportant if it doesn't reflect what's in your inbox. If this doesn't relate to real world, world problems, it will be fun, but it won't matter. And he said something surprising. And he said, I said, and so can we come and brief you once every three months? And he said, yes. That's very unusual. Senators don't have time for blue sky thinking, sadly enough. And not only did he say yes, but he said, yes, you need a Republican. And I said, who? And he said, Dick Lugar is the most thoughtful Republican out there. And Dick Lugar was outside of foreign relations. And we had the joy of meeting with Ron and Lugar once every three months, getting feedback from the real world problems they were facing. Um, and finally, I'll take you to this sort of thing. The day after a coup in the Soviet Union, uh, we were to brief them. And I'd given a grant to a guy named Ash Carter at Harvard, who was doing a study of the location of weapons material and, and, and technology throughout the Soviet Union. I called him up and said, Chief, can you kind of hurry up that study? He said, actually, I've completed the research. The next year was writing. So he came down, he briefed the senators, they pulled together 20 Republicans, 20 Democrats, and they wrote a piece of legislation called the Cooperative Threat Reduction uh, Program, which is known as non uh, on the back of an envelope, and then I later went into the Clinton administration to, to, try to, um, to, to try to implement it. But it was a question of drawing down the weapons material and technology before. So I, mean, I tell that long story just to say, Palantir can really be relevant. Uh, to today's issues, and knowing how to engage the policy process as well as the, you know, take advantage of the extraordinary freedom and opportunity of, the, of philanthropy, um, and give you that enormous satisfaction um, of what you know, like you can get stuff done. Well, I've got this working again, well, so we we're, we 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 got this. So we, <laughs> thanks, to, thanks to Amy. So. <laughs> Just spend us a second to let us know kind of your impressions of working with Dick Luger. What was he like? He was obviously one of Indiana's own. So it would be interesting to hear that. Dick Luger was an extraordinary senator, um, an extraordinary leader. Um, he, uh, as you can imagine, I have tremendous admiration for him. Um, he was very well liked in the Senate, which was a good thing. Mean, he doesn't prove to be a nice guy. Uh, people on both sides of the, of the aisle trusted him, uh, liked him, uh, took him seriously, knew he was thoughtful, knew he knew how to listen, which is one of those lost arts. Um, and as a result, when he needed to persuade, he could. Uh, because he listened to other people's points of view, you know, for years in advance of that. Um, he was willing to make the time to think about long term things. I have to say, it's not only that he was a man of great character, uh, but it also was a different time. Um, that was back, I mean, just, you know, just 97, it's not that long ago, right? Um, but in, in those days, they weren't spending every night fundraising. Uh, they were fundraising a lot, but it wasn't every night. So they got to know each other, members of Congress and the Senate, uh, knew each other's families. Um, it's, it's harder to demonize the people of the other party when, when you, you know, they do a barbecue together. Um, but he was, you know, he was, he was thoughtful, he would stick with an issue, he would go to issues that weren't exciting in the moment. Uh, he wasn't, he was the opposite of a grand standard. Um, and as a result, he got a whole lot done, very quiet. Well, one thing I've discovered about Indiana is that humility is an important uh, a characteristic of many many Hoosiers. So. Have, they, have, they, have they fixed you? <laughs> well, they're, they're, they're working on it. They're working on it. We're working on it. 
I'm, I'm trying to learn. So. <laughs> but speaking of a, a, a different time, you, you conveyed very nicely the cooperative the non lure program as a, an, an example of philanthropy doing something innovative to spur uh, policy innovation. Can you think of anything similar happening today? Is there anything that, that's happening that's like, like that? Well, we certainly have, I mean, I, I think you're seeing, you know, some wonderful things. I mean, the Alliance for Green Revolution and I mean, things to criticize. I'm not saying all of these things are perfect, but here's an example of, of a philanthropy, in this case, two gates in Rock um, uh, but also some indigenous support within Africa, uh, putting together a, a mechanism that brings the private, public, and, and philanthropic or charitable sectors together around a hard problem. And the hard problem is how to feed Africa and, and, and deal with the fact that. So much of Africa are women who are smallholder farmers, and how do you bring technology, but also market mechanisms and and, and, and other forces to bear in maximizing uh, their, their capacity to produce uh, food and the income earning possibilities. So I, you, know, you see a lot of them now. You know, one of my favorite things that was, that was the, the, the notion of advanced market commitments, mm -hmm. which is old news for everybody here probably, but. You know, here's an example of Gates and Rockefeller has done this as well. Going, to, you, know, with, you know, here we are in a situation where there are no market incentives for doing research into the diseases of the poor, which is the poor can't pay and the poor countries can't pay. Uh, but to go to where R&D happens, so into the private sector and say, look, we'll provide some of the upfront up investment that allow you to do research into the diseases of the poor, and if you come up with a vaccine or a, you know, whatever uh, product, uh, we will promise in advance to buy it in large enough quantities to have justified uh, the work having been done. Uh, that kind of inventive working across sectors on a complex problem, um, tapping all the resources we have as humanity, is to me you know, one, of, one of the exciting things that's happening well, that, that, those are very um, uh, well professionally staffed foundations, which are what you have had a lot of experience with at Carnegie, Alton Jones, and RBF. But you then you went on to found the uh, Global Philanthropy Forum. So what was what was the rationale for that? What what were you trying to achieve with that? What was the need you were trying to fill with that that new institution? So so I moved. To, I'm I'm an East Coast. Girl. So uh, I was born in New York, spent my early childhood in Boston, spent most of my adulthood in, in Washington, D.C., um, and thought the whole world was connected by Amtrak. Um, <laughs> and but when I came out of the Clinton administration, and when we finished our work together after we did that, I, I came away with the sense that the biggest security problem we face as a nation is a lack of a public consensus of our world in the world an inability to act in the face of Rwanda, not knowing what the public position, you know, permissions are, and that's just one, one example, but not having uh, a, a broad, clear consensus on our world in the world. I want to either go back to Carnegie, where I've taken a leave of absence, go back to Carnegie to start a program that was about a listening from the public on um, what, what Americans feel are our values and how we should act on those values. At the same time, the World Affairs Council um, recruited me out of nowhere up in Northern California, and I realized, wait, Northern California is a place where they don't take borders seriously to begin with. You know, you don't have to sort of tear down the idea that, you know, that, that you know, what we do has to stop at the borders. In fact, you know, working globally makes sense to people in Silicon Valley. And you don't have to tear down the borders between disciplines or sectors there. They, you know, they already think that way. They, a total disregard for borders, um, and sometimes in good ways and sometimes in not so good ways. Um, and they don't think anything happens in Washington. On the contrary, they wish nothing would happen in Washington uh, and Silicon Valley. So you know, I went out there and I was focused on international issues, doing a radio show, uh, and I kept meeting people in their 30s who made hundreds of millions of dollars and had no idea what they could do with them. They weren't even wasting it on Porsches. I, you know, I don't agree with people at Porsches, but you know, they weren't even spending it on themselves. The wealth only had one purpose. It was a metric for their success. That was it. Um, and it was frustrating to me because there were so many needs in the world that they could help fill. 
both with you know, brain power and attention. And so I became a bit of a proselytizer. And I finally decided that you know, entrepreneurs like affecting change. And that's normally the barrier. And that was not the barrier. The barrier, my supposition was that the, the hypothesis was that the, that the barrier was they didn't know whether they were going to be work. And if I could show them that it can work, then. Uh, and so did a conference focused on economic development because there's so much data around it. We had 60 years of World, you know, World Bank data, et cetera. And, I mean, had it been K-12 education, I, I wouldn't have had the data I needed to be to this way. Anyway, within, within two years, less than two years, 583 of them started uh, foundations or donor advised funds. So the hypothesis, the timing was right. Um, now, I see Una sitting in the back row. Um, she thinks she won't get called on if she sees me. <laughs> oh boy, you don't know me. So, um, so, so Una's sister, Didi, um, uh, who lives in Lagos in, in Nigeria, uh, helped build uh, something called the Africa Philanthropy Forum, before, built on the same model. The idea is to build a network of high net worth Africans who will give where they made their wealth. So the money doesn't go to London, the money doesn't go to Geneva. They're giving where they make their wealth, they're investing where they make their wealth, and using their policy boards, because most successful uh, folks have got, you know, they walk in and, and, and see senior officials. Use that policy voice not only for self-interest, but use that policy voice for, for the interests of, of the country as a whole. Um, and um, I, I just mention that because it thinks she won't get called. Oh, I just called on her. <laughs> That's what you get for sitting in the back. Yeah, so, uh, but yeah, and that, this is fascinating because you say the uh, individuals that you, you brought together took this knowledge and acted on it. What differences that are we should know about are important in the ways the high net worth individuals consume knowledge and information compared to the way foundations do that? And were there any insights, frustrations, breakthroughs that you saw individuals doing? Things with knowledge that, that didn't succeed or did succeed better with foundation. You know, it's interesting. There, there was a report by an outfit called Harder, and a, it, it's the peer to peer study that some of you may know about. Um, it took a look at how program officers consume knowledge. Um, and and I, it, is, it is completely aligned with what we've learned about how our membership consumes knowledge. So it's interesting that the, that the individual wealth creator. Uh, when it comes to it comes to using knowledge in their in their grant making, operate very much like a professional grant maker. Um, you know, first they their their most trusted sources are peers, are each other, and their grantees. Those are the those are the most trusted sources of knowledge. Second, if when they take it on, it needs to be curated because there's an incredible inflow of information. Uh, to to any funder, as as you know, somebody being sources of that information uh, as well as consumers of it. Um, third, I, you know, there that information has to come within the context of action, within the context of what what they're hoping to achieve. So random information that they can't use yet does get put over here <laughs> on the shelf so they can consume the information that will be most usable. Um, so I guess I'd argue that they are more alike than they think they are. Now they think they're unique, that they're different, and that they think differently from program officers. Um, but in the end, in that sense, in how they consume knowledge, um, they're remarkably alike. Is there a difference in terms of the sense of responsibility or duty that they have with the, with the funds, as of one being kind of part of a professional trust foundation, the other one being something that this personally belongs to you or your family? Right. No, I mean, I think they have a sense that they're allowed to take extraordinary risks because they created that wealth to begin with. Um, but having said that, yeah, I want to make sure that the, what I'm saying is true because having said that, there is a timidity as well, a worry about being embarrassed. Um, and, and foundation program officers know that their job is to take risks. They know that they did. You know, they, they understand that that's part of the role. Now they're not supposed to you know, just blow money, but you, you know what I'm saying. Right. They they um, and they make sure that the president of the foundation understands the risk factors, but they know and and, and they don't. Yeah, yeah. But you see situations in which, you know, uh, 
Mark Zuckerberg had kind of a colossal crash and burn around uh, his, his earliest philanthropy in, in Newark and um, an effort to, uh, when it comes to public schools in Newark. And people took that on. Um, and I said, gee, I don't want to have a front page story about me. And by the way, I've never failed at anything in my life. I'm 35 and I'm a billionaire. And I'm not used to failing and I don't, yeah. So, so while, in particular, Silicon Valley funders see themselves as risk takers, um, I, you know, and, 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 and see, and, and in their rhetoric say, well, failing fast is what's most important. And if you haven't failed, you obviously didn't try hard enough. You know, you didn't take enough risks. That's the narrative. Um, but if while you were in graduate school, you came up with Google, and it ended up being one of the best, biggest companies in the world, and you've never <laughs> experienced failure, do you want to have blown it in your first philanthropic you know, uh, effort? Uh, I, I don't mean to say a lot, Larry. It's like, yeah, I'm just pointing out, some, many of these people have never experienced failure. And they are watched by the public. It's a great newspaper story if they screw up a lot, a lot of it. And I think they're conscious of that. Well, speaking of failures, maybe we can go back to the, the grand challenges that RBF and Carnegie were interested in. And the, the one failure we're glad we didn't have was with the uh, loose nukes getting out of the Soviet Union. What are, what are some of the challenges you see today that are big, grand challenges that philanthropy should be paying attention to? Okay, where well, you're going to hear my bias, and I would, you understand everything I'm saying is, is um, you know, the multiple points of view. And I think just as, as we, as Amir and I, were concerned about global governance um, back then, I'm really concerned right now about national governance. I'm very concerned about what's happening to liberal democracy. And by that, I mean democracies in which you don't just vote, but civil liberties are are, are protected, there's a commitment to pluralism. Um, and if you look around the world at, at democracy, if you look at from the Philippines to Turkey to Poland to Hungary to South Africa under Zuma to Brazil, a little bit to Mexico and to here, you're seeing this move away from liberal to illiberal democracy. And that's a real a real concern. I now I sound very patriotic, but I think we have this fabulous system of self-governance in which all three sectors have a role to play, and each of us has a role to play. Um, and it's, it's resilience in the face of change. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's been particularly good at, at providing for prosperity over time. You know, it holds so much promise. It has demonstrated itself to be not perfect, but better than a lot, and certainly better than illiberalism. Uh, that I'm, I'm very worried uh, that we as a society, but that other democracies are experiencing this precipitous decline in trust in one another, in institutions, this extraordinary polarization, uh, you know, even more acute racism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, you know, the various divides, those dividing lines, um, have grown so strong that I think that there's a big role for philanthropy and civil society more broadly to help us figure out how to have conversations across difference, um, how to find ways to solve problems together. And I think this is where, you know, I sort of came here to confess to him here because I've been very focused, to the extent that I've focused on philanthropy, I've been focused on what some people call strategic philanthropy. In other words, philanthropy that is focused on solving a discrete problem. And you put all your resources your intangible assets and, and your financial resources towards solving that problem. Um, that's one job for philanthropy, but there's another job, and that other job is community building. And I think sometimes we, sometimes I, have forgotten that essential part of, of you know, the role of philanthropy in civil society. So looking at one problem solve, focus, in the process of solving problems, let's build social capital. In the process, let's advanced citizen agency, it's that you can make a difference. When those things break down, you know, that's, a, that's an existential danger in my view. So you, at, at Aspen, you've co convened the Aspen Philanthropy Group that's composed of CEO of some major foundations, Hewlett Packard, Ford Gates. Um, uh, do you expect them to be able to play a role in helping philanthropy 
be a force for democracy to, to restore some of its community building um, aspects. Yeah, I mean, I will say you're not seeing folks like this, though, supporting, I don't know, the, the Salvation Army, the United Way, you know, the, the widely distributed lots of small grants in a community designed to ensure that you've got a robust civil society. Not just about today's problem, but building the capacity to solve problems, right, by having a robust civil society. They're not doing that so much. They're problem focused. Hewlett has, under leadership of a really fabulous CEO, Larry Kramer, uh, who's a constitutional law professor. Right? Yeah, he was here last year. Oh, was he? Okay, so you know how smart Larry is. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of Larry. Because, because Larry is not only smart, but he doesn't really need to tell you so, which is a wonderful combination. Uh, you know, he, he's self-critical, he challenges his own thinking as much as he'll challenge yours, so I'm mad for him. He started something called the Madison Initiative, and did he talk about that when he was here? He did, a little bit, a little yeah. bit. Yeah, well that's focused on this, on this problem of how do you make sure that democracy works. Um, he has been very careful not to be partisan, which is really hard. Um, to pull off. It, it's not only really hard to be nonpartisan, it's hard to be seen as nonpartisan. Um, I think that most people would see Hewlett Foundation as a central left. Right. Yeah, and, he, and he spoke to that challenge of getting people on various sides to want to play with the folks on the other side. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, it's, it's huge. Yeah, he's had some, some he's had a failure. He, he brought in, um, he asked, you know, when, when program chairs develop each year their strategy for the year ahead and it's the, you know, it shows their theory of change, what they think works, and they advocate uh, grantees in that context. Um, he required that they all bring in somebody who disagrees with them to shoot holes in there through their, uh, their ideas. And I mentioned this to the students that about two years later I said, yes, yeah, so how did that work? And he said it was a miserable failure. Oh. You know, they either brought in people who secretly agreed with him, or they brought in people who were such morons they couldn't make the other case. And so <laughs> you know, they, just, they purposely brought in some really stupid arguments. Um, and and he said, we never seem to have those issues in seminars when we have them. I don't understand. <laughs> but 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 he's serious. And I was telling the students earlier. So sorry for repeating this. But you know, I I I've been very concerned about you know. Pluralism is defined as multiple cultures living side by side within a larger shared um, shared society, and there, you know, it's it's you know I've been thinking of racial uh, diversity and, and cultural diversity and religious diversity and that that kind of pluralism. And I call up his program officer in charge of the Madison Initiative, and I said, you know, I understand you're an expert in pluralism. I want to pick your brain. And he said, Oh, you liberals are totally hypocritical when it comes to pluralism. What do you mean? And and he said, You don't you're not you don't believe in ideological pluralism. You know, I said the liberals shout down speakers they disagree with or demand that they get disinvited and da 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 so you're not the real thing. And I thought, you know, he's right. It, it is true that when somebody's sentence begins with and I heard on Fox News today, I don't happen I just tend not to do the second half of the sentence. You know, that I am as guilty of this as, as anyone. And um, I've been very careful personally to try not to be that person, um, to try to, to actually be committed to pluralism in all its respects. But I think it's cool that Larry Kramer hired to run an important program somebody who's coming at the same set of issues but more from center-right position. Um, and, and that's healthy and it's interesting. And what it means is, you know, what Larry would say is, at, at you know, at maximum you might learn something or even change your mind, but at a minimum you'll hone your argument when you hear the other side. So there's no downside to it. Well, speaking of playing together nicely, not to get gossipy, but when you bring together the CEOs of these major foundations together, Kind of, do, do they ever agree on doing something together, or do they always look for something that's going to make them super distinctive? How does that work? They do agree on doing things yeah. together, but they do tend to have signature programs that are theirs. I mean, for example, Madison Initiative is very much a signature program for Hewlett. And Larry is almost uniquely committed to ideological pluralism, for example. 
um, to the point that I've been able to match make with him, to go to him with philanthropists of a very different political view than his, but who share a view on a given, a given issue. We, in fact, is, I just moved from um, San Francisco to Washington, D.C., and I had to get out of town. I mean, that, that, because I had just interviewed on stage the way you're interviewing me. I interviewed Charles Koch. Yeah. And, you know, packed my bags and got out of San Francisco. But it, it, you know, it was seen as controversial uh, to do that. But Charles Koch and his foundation were essential to the effort to achieve criminal justice reform. And Charles Koch can be essential to the effort to get immigration reform and actually get a path to citizenship for dreamers because he believes in those things. He may believe in those things for different reasons, but that's where he ends up. And those of us who've been in the policy realm, it really helps to have people from across the political spectrum uh, support a point of view. I'll say that we would have never gotten that far, right? We would have never gotten some of the most important innovations in economic development if it hadn't been that the uh, that the evangelical community that was perceived as uh, kind of seeing international aid as, as international welfare, uh, you know, there's a perception that they were um, would oppose. And the fact that they were on board made it easy for George W. Bush to embrace that part. I thought that was an important program. So, so you've been spending uh, the Half of, well, half of your week with us so far at the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy and, and get, get to know a little bit about what we do. What, what are your senses of how we could make a contribution to the, the challenge of building civil society and the, the grander possibilities of philanthropy? What are your, some of your reactions to that? Uh, well, number one, this is the best half of the week. <laughs> it's, it's really been fun. I, I, I kind of fell in love with Indianapolis already uh, in my first, my, my first several hours here. But this school is remarkable, and we have remarkable people, both students and faculty and, and, and uh, folks doing research. Um, and it's exciting to be in a place where um, there's real comfort in, in kind of conversations um, and research that involves both the practitioners and those who get the concepts and the theory. Um, so, so the invention of this school itself is, is, I think, enormously important, particularly at a time when um, you know, the social sector is, is going to play a, an essential role in, in the future of our country, but not just the future of our country, and democracies around the world, and, and non-democracies. So I, I, I guess I come away both you know, in love with the ideas that I'm hearing, deeply impressed and, and frankly armed by the research and the findings you've had, but also just believing that this is the kind of institution that's going to be so much a part of, of what works in our society. And you know, the guy, you have a straight and narrow. Well, now you're part of it too in some way too, so we, we appreciate the good words and look forward to working with you going so, forward. So let me mention Ted there. He, he thought he wasn't going to call out too. Um, he leads a working group that is uh, going to create uh, something called the Generosity Commission. Am I allowed to say this? Is this public or am I like blowing this? Okay. Um, so the Generosity Commission, which will, it's, it's a successor to the Philo Commission from the, back of the late 60s, but it, it's going to take a look at the role of land in civil society. And by generosity, we're, we're including volunteering as well as giving um, in it. I shouldn't say we, Ted, Ted is leading this effort. Mira and I are on a subcommittee looking at, um, looking at research. But there is an opportunity to bring the issues that you guys are focused on uh, to the public eye a little more and make it for more part of a, a public conversation. So thank you, Ted, for making this happen. Thank you, Ted, indeed, for many things. And uh, let me ask one last question, and then we'll, leave it up. we'll, we'll uh, open it up to the audience. And my last question has to do with the fact, as you saw at our school, most of our students are women, and as are most of our faculty. When I started in the field, uh, that wasn't the case. And I'm sure when you started in international security and in philanthropy, you were often the only woman in the room. Um, how has that affected your leadership style, and what are some of the changes that you see today, and what are some of the challenges you see for women in the field today? So philanthropy was, was better than international security, where I would literally be the only person in the room. And I was always the youngest person in the room. I, 
you grow out of that. You know, that's a fixable problem. In terms of, um, but I was, I was always, you know, I was the only, you know, I was a young woman uh, in a world of old men. Um, and I'll never forget, I was one of, you know, I was, I was an early member of the Council on Foreign Relations, or for a woman. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember walking into the Council on Foreign Relations and having everybody just turn and look. What, why is that person wearing the dress? You know, what is, I mean, that you feel like this weird oddity, you know, walking into the room. Um, and it was something, you know, that, that was the case in, 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 in my profession. Philanthropy was a much more diverse, generally, both of gender and, however, the presidents were all men, and they were all white men, all of them. It was, it was really, well, no, it was Ford Foundation back then, the Jim, uh, Jim, Jim, Jim. Oh, this wonderful president of Ford Forever Tech, Jim, Jim, Jim Johnson. Johnson. Yeah. Thank you. Who was that? It Andrew. was. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah. But otherwise, it was white men. Um, and uh, but philanthropy has always been better, and the social sector more broadly has always been better that way. And in fact, you have the other situation in which uh, nonprofits are completely staffed by women. Um, who are you know, willing to take the risks associated with that, with that work. And it worries me a bit because, well, now I'm going to give you a worry. Um, I worry that the nonprofit sector is not socioeconomically diverse, um, that we pay so badly that you tend to be hiring middle class kids uh, who can afford to, you know, don't have a big student debt. Uh, as they walk in, and um, they can afford to take a job that, that pays a little less when they when they could be paid more, um, and that's a hard decision for somebody to make who, who has got huge debt or other reasons to be concerned about about their income. It's a worry of mine. I when I years ago I went trouncing around to various foundation presidents saying what you should do is <laughs> is, is is take each of your grantees and give a certain amount of money and tell them there's a floor beneath which they cannot hire. They should use that pot of money to bring everybody up to at least that floor. Um, but that's got to be an ongoing grant, so you can see why the idea didn't sell at all, because it's just like a blank check. Um, but it worried me, and, and at the World Affairs Council, I made a point of <coughs> raising you know, the lowest salary by $20,000, which was not, not doubling it, it was upping it by 30%. Um, because I wanted a, a, an economically diverse um, uh, you know, group of a team uh, at the World Affairs Council. That, that's an ongoing problem. I don't know the solution. It would be wonderful for, the, for you guys to tell us. We, we tend to attract adventurous students who end up being adventurous people in the sector. So one of our alums, actually, Rusty Stahl, started an organization called Emerging Practitioners in Philanthropy, mm -hmm. which is trying to get foundations and others to invest in talent um, yeah. and more systematically and, and in, in a more diverse way as well. Yeah. But to, on to our adventurous uh, um, participants out there in the audience. It's your turn. I have many more questions. <laughs> so so the, the first Global Philanthropy Forum, um, the first four people who asked, asked a question were male. And then the fifth was, was female. But this woman came running up to me and said, tell your staff not to give the microphone to men. And I said, you're on. And he said, you know, if the men speak before they think, and women wait to think and then speak, I can't do it. <laughs> anyway, I don't want to be rude. Please. <laughs> My name is Geoffrey Mujisha. I'm a visiting scholar from Uganda mm -hmm. on the Ford Foundation funded NGO Leadership Transition Fellowship Program. Um, I'm, I'm transitioning out of my position as CEO from a nonprofit that exists to serve the most at risk populations uh, in Uganda and in particular looking at uh, health and social justice, access to health and social justice for uh, sex workers and their clients as well as sexual minority groups. So clearly those are stigmatized by the law and by community 
And so it's uh, quite a tough job that I've been doing for the last 12 years. But that says, says two things. One, about the government itself. When you are talking about institutional strengthening, our governments need institutional strengthening because some of the laws are discriminatory and uh, the, 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 the leaders are getting away with a lot uh, in that regard. So as civil society, we step up to do quite a bit. But obviously, civil society is then worse off in terms of access to resources, in terms of strengthening these institutions, and yet we're addressing real issues. So I guess uh, my question to you and to a point you made earlier of this not real effort to strengthen institutions, even from the grant makers uh, from the north. And uh, my question is, is how, how, how much is that seen as an important aspect of funding organizations and, and activities in, in the south, where I come from? Um, because without that strengthening, then certainly you know you're just doing project funding and grants, and not sustainably sorting out some of the issues that are critical and are affecting us. So that's my question. The second one, I guess, would be, um, what do I have to do to get an opportunity to visit the Aspen Institute as I'm here, so that I can learn from you, <laughs> and, your, and your great team. Thank you. Well, you just missed one because we just had a, um, a week of emerging nonprofit leaders, one of whom was from Europe, and uh, a really wonderful guy. Uh, but we do this as competitively selected, and it's 18 emerging, by emerging, it doesn't be people in their 30s uh, kind of age group. Um, but and your successor. <laughs> it might be your successor, exactly. Um, am I right that the, the, the LGBT community is, is in essence, outlawed? In yes. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and, and even outside of the law, the way in which people are treated um, within society reflects that same pretty horrific bias. Um, the, the, and a friend of mine ran for president, who, Alvaro Altuna, uh, and one of the big problems was that he wasn't married. Right. And I'm sure there are other reasons they didn't elect him. The fact that he lived in New York was probably not good either. <laughs> uh, you know that he wasn't there. Uh, but I should, I, you know, I should say it was, a, it was a, a, I think it was part of the bias. Is that fair to say? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess the reason I'm excited about the growth of indigenous philanthropy uh, in Africa is that there is a, a greater chance that strengthening the sector itself will become a priority because most um, donors from the, the, the say, private philanthropy from the North and, and uh, the West tends to be problem focused, as you say, except in post complex settings where there's a real sense that you've got, got to rebuild it. And, um, and so supporting local leadership coming up, not just in politics, but local leadership throughout civil society coming up is, becomes that such an obvious priority. Um, but in general, you know, they, there is money for that, but not enough given the nature of the challenge. And I'd say the same is true here. The same is true here. So unless you have these kind of extreme situations like the you know, post-conflict Liberia, um, for example, Rwanda, uh, that's where uh, you get the, it's, it's, it's a little bit better in terms of the funding. This is part of our educational job of all of us in the room. Um, is this you know, the importance of, as I said before, the capacity, capacity for society to solve uh, by, by building and strengthening civil society institutions? And I don't only mean nonprofit. I would say an independent media is an essential civil society actor. So there are actors that even in the for-profit sector that are essential to a coherent and cohesive society. So I think some people, some funders, we really get it. Um, we need more. And you guys are part of the education, as are we. I think we have time for one more question. Jay, thank you so much for being here. I, your whole background was fascinating. 
part that I was focused on was the Global Philanthropy Forum. And I'm really interested in what you've learned about how individuals, and these are primarily high net worth individuals, from different cultures, different countries, approach philanthropy. And because I do work at the Women's Philanthropy Institute, um, whether you saw some gender differences there. I, I hope you guys don't come away thinking I'm prejudiced against men. I'm really not. <laughs> <laughs> you hire them occasionally, I hear. Yeah, every once in a while. You know, and I had a father, and I had two brothers, and I got a husband. I mean, I love you men. But anyway, um, understanding the nuts and bolts and appreciating them, just what you were talking about, appreciating that part of the job, I, I find more takers amongst women philanthropists than men. Now, this is a you know, this is a sample of a couple thousand that I deal with, so it's not a great example. Um, but one of my favorite things at a, at a global philanthropy forum, um, Cheryl Sandberg, who COO of Facebook, who was treated as royalty back then, and then now and you know, we're seen as very much behind what they want with Facebook. Uh, but she, she spoke, and it was to a group of philanthropists, and for, you know, new philanthropists hate overhead. Right? And they don't want to pay for overhead, and they just want to pay for the project. Somehow, whenever it's somebody else paying for the overhead, and that somebody else doesn't exist. Um, and she, much to my gratitude, stood up and said, I'm CLO of Facebook. I'm overhead. And nobody questions whether to pay me. <laughs> and you all come out of the private sector. Why are you questioning overhead? You invested in overhead company, and if you hadn't, you wouldn't have a company, and you wouldn't be here today. Yes, Cheryl. <laughs> well done. Now, she, um, it was important for, I uh, mean, they respected, you know, the, this was in Silicon Valley, so she was, she was Silicon Valley royalty at the time. But I also find that in the, the lots of the, as you know, wonderful networks of women donors, and it's always easier to have a conversation about the nuts and bolts and not just the razzle dazzle I find in that setting. What do you find? The same. The same. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm worried that I'm not, you know, I've gotten biased because I am dealing with it, only the sample I'm dealing with. But, uh, yeah. Everybody's so, yeah. Thank you so much for taking this yeah. time with me and making this visit so wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Jane. Before we uh, say uh, uh, thank you to Jane, uh, I just want to let you know that we have two other events coming up uh, that Jane prepared us for. We have Sue Cunningham coming on October 10th, president of CASE. And then on the 17th of October, we have a wonderful panel of young philanthropists talking about rethinking black philanthropy. But the most important thing right now is to thank Jane for being with us and for informing us and inspiring us. Thank you, Jane. Thank you.